Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. Here he says again, Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. And because of false brethren unawares. False brethren? He had to judge. They don't line up with this book. I know the book wasn't there, but they didn't line up with God's word that was being preached at the time. In letters and by word. They weren't lining up with, the, with God's word. And because a false brother that unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out your liberty, which you have in Christ Jesus, that ye might bring us into bondage. What are they doing? These are false converts coming in saying, I'm one of you. I'm one of you. And then what they do is they try to get them back under the Old Testament Levitical laws. They go against this book, but they started out acting like they're for this book. They're for the gospel for today. I've seen that happen, brother, says Christ. I'll call his name out, Edward P.F., uh, King's Table, um, Deborah Gill, that whole group over there, when I was first saved, they were all under uh, uh, King James Video Ministries, and they were all saying, yes, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That's the true plan of salvation. I'm one of you. And when they got that cult of personality, they made enough friends and got enough people to think that they're something great when they're not, I remember Deborah Gill kept saying, go to Robert Breaker's channel. Kept telling everybody under King James Video Ministries to go to Robert Breaker's channel. Go to Robert Breaker's channel. You really want to go to that channel. It's a really good channel. It's just, it's just as good as Brian Denley. It, it's better sometimes. You need to go to Robert Bre And then you go over to Robert Breaker's and you find out he's teaching a false gospel. No repentance. No prayer. Just head belief. And you're saved. No changed life. And when you hit these people up and you back them into the corner because they can no longer hide, by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned, when they got brought in the spotlight and it got shown that they were false brethren unawares brought in, I'm one of you. What they do? They tried to take, draw as many disciples away after him, and then they turned around for what they really believe. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Oh no, it's, it's faith alone, it's faith alone. They already, they already believed that to begin with. But they came in and they started pretending to be one of us. Now, if we had made them prove themselves, we probably would have caught them a lot sooner and thrown them out, these fakes and these frauds. But we didn't make them prove themselves. They said they were one of us, they're one of us. And it's all online, too. How can you prove someone online? You really can't. You can keep talking to them until they, you can get their words, until they slip up on their words. And they make mistakes with the words, and like I said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The true, their true heartfelt intentions will come out, if you're good at that kind of thing. But if you're just bouncing, there's a lot of people talking, and they're just little, they're not like a huge conversation, they're just little snippets of people talking back and forth on, on in the comment section under YouTube and whatnot. It's like, you can't really prove them off the little comments. They might have made a mistake, we make mistakes sometimes. But the big thing that tr proved that they were false is when they did a 180 on the true plan of salvation. That they professed, I'm one of you. That's the salvation I, that's the gospel I got saved off. I'm one of you. And when they were back into the corner, they did a 180. And they went over to the enemy's side, Satan's side. They turned their back on this book. But there you see, there's false brethren. And Paul's judging them. He's saying, hey... They're false brethren. They're going against the true plan of salvation. They're not lining up with the Word of God. Okay. Get them out. Philippians 3.17 Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk as you have us for an example. Mark them? You're judging. Yep, that person's true. Mark them which walk as you have us for for an example, you're supposed to, brothers, we're supposed to be set an example. Men in ministry, you're held to a higher standard. You're supposed to be set an example. And yeah, this is a little, you know, kind of a poke at some of the brethren in ministry that claim that the bow buildings are bad, which they are, and that house church is the way to go, and they are, and yet they don't have a house church when they can have a house church. Be wary of that. They're not setting the example. Some of them are setting bad examples. Brothers says Christ, I've set bad examples. I'm working harder, and we all need to work harder to set good examples. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which you, 
which walk, so as you have us, for an example, is their walk lined up with this book? They're good. Why does he tell us we need to judge? Mark, we need to judge. Why? Verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, now I tell you even weeping, that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. This repentantless gospel that they call it as he believism. This repentant, repentantless gospel. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. They that are of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. The Romans rode to hell. The Romans rode to hell. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction. The reprobate. Remember we talked about that. The reprobate. They have a profession of faith, but they're reprobate. What does that mean? They're worthless. They're, whose end is destruction. They're on their way to hell and then the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. They need to get saved. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Yea, hath God said, Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. You can be the final authority, not the Lord God Almighty through His perfect, by the Holy Spirit, through His Son, by His perfect written word. No, none of that. You can be the final authority. You can add to this book. You can subtract from this book. You can live however you want to live. No. Whose God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame. We've talked about this. I walk downtown. I, I am vexed. And I see their shame. And these people are just glorying in their shame. Who mind earthly things. They're worldly. Remember, they are the world, therefore speak the word. The world here, they conform to the world. They love the world. They're friends of the world. They're, less, they're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Who mind earthly things. Verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. We're supposed to line up with this book. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior. Look for the Savior. Remember, sanctification. Uh, I see. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. It's the motivation. We prove ourselves daily with the life that we're living because we're looking for that blessed hope. Because we know when we get caught up, what happens next, brothers and sisters of Christ? The judgment seat of Christ. That's what happens next. We're going to get judged on our life that we live down here as a, as a, as a Christian. How's it going to go for you? Remember, gold, silver, and precious stones are wood, hay, and stubble. Is most of your life wood, hay, and stubble? Because you've been fighting God most of your life? Fighting this book most of your life? Or you're going to have gold, silver, and precious stones? You're going to have rewards. I've always said this before. One of those people, because the Bible makes it out like there, there's going to be brethren that get up there. They're going to stand before God and everything gets burnt up. But they themselves will not will be saved as so by fire. They themselves won't be burnt up. Why? Because they're saved. They've got that crown of life. But they amounted to nothing as a Christian. And there they are standing before God with nothing to show for their life as a Christian. Now it could have been someone who got saved last minute and got caught up. Eh, there's that. But more than anything, I... The way the Bible makes it out, we're supposed to, once we look for the Savior, it's an action. It's how you live your life. If you're truly looking for that blessed hope every day, could happen today, if you believe. There's some brother, it's a whole other study. They've turned their back. They're falling away. But you have these false converts post-trib and mid-trib. They're not, they're not looking for Jesus Christ. Now, they could be someone that's newly saved. And they can get messed up in doctrine at first, but eventually, if they truly love the truth, and they truly love this Word, and the Holy Spirit's in them, God's going to get them over to the truth. There's no such thing as someone being a posty-toasty for 50 years. Their whole life is a... God will get you to the truth. What's the problem there? They're not looking for Jesus Christ. Their eyes are on the world. Carly minded walking after the flesh. What did it just say over here? Uh, to mind earthly things. For our conversation is heaven. They're not thinking about heavenly things. They're too fixated on worldly things. 
For our conversation in heaven, for once we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, our vile bodies, we're safe, sinner. we're two-thirds redeemed. Our soul and our spirit are redeemed. This wicked body of flesh has not been redeemed. I still sin sometimes. Every day, I still sin. Every day. It might not be the physical act, praise God. He's gotten all, most, almost all the physical acts out. But there's sometimes I'll say something stupid that I can't take back and I have to apologize. I made a mistake, I said something I shouldn't have said, or I thought something I shouldn't have said. I still sin. I'm still fighting this wicked body of flesh. I'm trying to put the flesh down. One of the best ways to put the flesh down is prayer. Three ways. Prayer, the Word of God, staying in the Word of God daily, hardcore if you have to, and um, fasting. Those are the three biggest ways to put the flesh down and to keep the flesh in check. Okay. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. There are false brethren out there. Brother says Christ. And God, uh, uh, Paul, God warns us through Paul, saying, hey, he ceased not to warn us night and day with tears. That's where we're getting at next. Turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Some of the brethren in ministry have forgotten that. Your job is to exhort the brethren and through preaching the word, not the world. Some of them are getting on to World War III, ec the worldwide economics, the worldwide collapse, the mark of the beast, the world, you know, this, that. They're getting so stuck on the world. And they forget, you're supposed to be preaching the doctrines that are for today. You're supposed to be teaching instruction in righteousness for today. If I can sum it all up, you're supposed to be exhorting the brethren to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ by living the life of Christ. To fear God, keep His commandments, the, teaching them to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, and that they're part of the ministry of reconciliation. To teach them that they're supposed to be sanctified and cleaning their life up. Looking for that blessed hope. You exhort them to continue being a living uh, and a verbal witness for Jesus Christ every day looking for that blessed hope. We're not supposed to get them so distracted by the world, the world, the world. God will deal with the world. We're supposed to be focusing on the Lord and our walk with the Lord and the life that God has given us where we are. Okay. Feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. And Paul talks about that. It's preaching the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with long suffer, all longsuffering and doctrine. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but at their own lust heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall turn themselves from the truth and be turned unto fables, the world, and become worldly. The world, the world, the world. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul's got fish saying, you've got to prove this, you've got to prove that, you've got to prove that. Prove all things. Prove it all, that you're saved and born again. And you're supposed to prove yourself, that's what I do individually, and then we're supposed to prove each other. The uh, Old Testament, I, I still try to memorize this one too, Old Testament... Um, I think it's in Psalms, or it could be Proverbs, that the countenance of one man sharpeneth another countenance like iron. That the countenance of one man sharp. We're supposed to prove ourselves, and we're supposed to prove each other. We're supposed to help each other stay on this, in line with this book. We're supposed to help each other keep living a life of Christ. Try to prevent brothers and sisters of Christ from falling. We prevent each other from falling by exhorting each other through the scriptures and warning each other. And when we do fall, you correct one another and get us back up on our feet Standing together. Okay. But here he says, For after my party shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. He has to judge. How can you make a statement like that, Paul, unless you're judging? And proving these people. They're grievous wolves. That whole little circle of group that I mentioned earlier about they, they were part of e, uh, repentless gospel, what they call easy believism, and they came in and pretended like they were one of us. What are they? They're grievous wolves entering among you, not sparing the flock. 
They led a lot of brethren astray, and they put a lot of roadblocks in front of people that need to get saved and born again. They confused a lot of people. Over here it's this way, over there it's this way. Well, well, well which way is it? And you got people like Billy Graham. There are many paths to heaven. I guess they're all right. No, there's only one way to heaven. Jesus Christ says it the best. Like I said, I don't ignore Jesus Christ. He says it the best in the Gospels, where he says, Narrow is the way that leadeth to everlasting life. I, I, I'm paraphrasing. Please forgive me, brothers and sisters Christ. But broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go there and at. Narrow is the path. There's only one meteor under... There's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. There's one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one gospel at any given time, and this, because I'm a dispensational teacher, there's only one gospel at any given time, only one way to get saved. When Jesus was there, it was the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Now today, for the time of the Gentiles, Paul, it's the gospel that's revealed to Paul. There's only one way to heaven. And you got these greatest wolves coming in saying, well, you know, maybe it's not that way. Maybe it's this way. Or maybe we were just a little too overboard on repentance and we need to just cut that out. And we're a little too overboard on prayer. We need to cut that. And they start cutting and gutting the gospel till it's, it's, a, it's the false gospel. Is what they're pushing. They're, they're grievous wolves. 30. Also of your own selves. These grievous wolves come in and they mess up the flock. But of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. There are brethren that fall away. And they start giving in to doctrines of devils. They start giving in to lusts of the flesh. They start giving in to covetousness. They start getting into loving the world and the things of the world more than they love the Lord in this book. They start compromising. Be not conformed to this world. They start being a friend of the world. They start speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember. Why would you watch? I mean, seriously, why would you watch if you're not allowed to prove them? If you're not allowed to judge what you're watching? Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He's warning you to watch and keep your eyes open for these wolves in sheep's clothing. And it's not just these grievous wolves. You're also supposed to watch for brethren that are falling away. They're starting to go the way of the world. They're starting to give up on the Lord. They're starting to give up on the, the truth. And most importantly, if they start to give up on the true plan of salvation doesn't matter whether you think, well, they were saved and uh, they're cursed. They cry after, what about this minister or that? Do they teach the true plan of salvation? Are they King James Bible believers? Oh, yeah, they're kids. Do they teach the true plan of salvation? Well, kind of. So there is no kind of sort of. Do they teach that repentance is coming to God with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against him, throwing the old man at the foot of the cross? Do they teach that's what biblical repentance is? Well, no, they kind of took it out. Or they just say it, then you're to stay away from them. I don't care if they've got this teaching over here, right? Like I said, they can pair it with someone else taught. They're servants of Satan, willingly or ignorantly, when they turn their back on the true plan of salvation. Also of your own selves. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. It brings tears to my eyes when I pray to the Lord some nights because I see how bad the brethren are getting. You can't prove. We're not doing house churches. People are purposely scattered. We're being scattered. Sometimes the Lord has got us separated. But a lot of times it's you got men trying to push isolation, self-isolation. And there's... And, I'm in tears because the body of Christ is not... We don't have house churches. We don't have ordained house churches that have ordained elders, bishops, deacons. We're not doing things God's way. We're scattered. Now, I don't want to go into this too much, Brother Says Christ, but I read the Old Testament, and for instruction righteous, how the Jewish people got to the point where God just scattered them. I think that's the way we are today. We've been disobedient, not you personally, Brother Says Christ, or me personally, but I'm talking about the body of Christ as a whole. For the last hundred years, 
We've been very disobedient, going and doing things God, the world's way instead of God's way. And those of us who are trying to come back to doing things God's way, we're scattered. You don't want to do things my way? Fine. Like the Jewish people, you don't want to do that? He, he took the kingship away, and he scattered them. That's what we are. Like I said, just instruction righteousness. We're scattered. I pray for the brethren. I pray for all of you, brother, says Christ. Night and day, sometimes, with tears. I pray for other men in ministry that have fallen away with tears. They used to be great preachers, and now they're given into the world, and they just become worldly. I pray for a lot of the brethren that, have, that I've lost fellowship with or have turned their back on me and stabbed me in the back and say, Lord, get them back on the right path. I miss my brothers in Christ. I pray for the brethren as a whole, men in ministry, brethren I've lost all. I pray for everyone. And sometimes there's tears involved. We see here false brethren, wolves, and brethren that have fallen away, your own selves. And you're to judge. Paul's warning us. And he cries. He knows how bad. I think maybe God gave him. I couldn't have fathomed if Paul saw how the body of Christ is operating today. I, Paul would probably fall on his knees and lose it and just weep. He would. But even back then, he could see it. Mo, he turned his back. Galatians. Uh, false brethren brought in unawares to spy out your liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. The moment he left to go somewhere else, the wolves in sheep's clothing come in. You see that today with good men of God. The moment they, they used to be in the old days, they preach. Everyone always clings to one man that stands for truth, that stands for what's right. He passes away. Everything falls apart. Because everyone should be standing like that man is. But you have that cult of personality that they're all for that man, worshiping that man. But that man leaves. What happens? Everything tends to fall apart. Because wolves in sheep's clothing come in. Wolves in sheep's clothing. It's kind of like that idea of you have a shop and you got somebody that wants to rob the shop, but there's a police car out front. Paul's there. He's calling out these fools. And he's, you need to, I'm not the only one supposed to be doing it. You're supposed to be doing it too, brothers. Why aren't you doing it? Why am I the only Paul's like that police car. And that police car, okay, we get called. We got to go somewhere else. And as soon as it leaves... That's when that robber says, okay, now it's safe to go in there and rob the place. Okay, that, those men that were hardcore for the word of God standing up there, they're not budging in any way, shape, or form. Okay, now they're gone. These malleable people, I can go in there and mess them up now. Brothers says Christ, you all need to guard your heart by hiding God's word in your heart and standing for this book. Men, we need to be head coverings for the women. And then you need to remember that Jesus is our head covering. This is your head covering. The Word of God is through Jesus Christ. All right? Jesus is your head covering. Titus 1.9, Titus 1.9. Holding fast to the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. This is how you exhort the brethren. I've been trying to encourage some brethren, I guess, uh, on YouTube, not YouTube, uh, Facebook, that they're just, they're giving worldly sayings and saying, oh, there's a lot of truth in that. I said, you need to stop doing that and you need to get to using this. This is how you exhort the brethren. This is how you convince the gainsayers. You don't put this to the side and lower yourself to their level to speak to them on their level. No, you speak the truth. They take it or they leave it. We're not car salesmen, but you have people that will try to use worldly philosophy and worldliness to try to win people to Christ. No. We're supposed to be holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able to sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. This is how it's done. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. The problem that Paul had was the circumcision was coming in saying, oh yeah, what Jesus did, how he died for your sins, and was buried, and rose again the third day. Yeah, that's good. But, however, you need to get circumcised and keep the laws of Moses too. Okay. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped. You got to judge. They didn't prove themselves. They proved themselves to be false. 
The moment they stray from the true plan of salvation, they've proven themselves to be false. Get out! They must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things what they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. You see that all the time. It used to be TV evangelists, but now it's moved over to YouTube, like video platform evangelists. Okay? Money, 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 money. Battle building. Their, their businesses. Some, even some great men of God that I used to follow, they've become YouTubers, and now they've got a business, and they're running a business, a YouTube business. They're not preaching the Word of God and being a servant for God and in ministry for the Lord. They've forgotten why they were in ministry. Money starts doing the talking. Okay? Filthy lucre's sake. Verse 12, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, Christians are always liars, evil beasts, low bellies. Paul's saying what someone else said. This witness is true. How can Paul say that? Because he looked at them and they proved themselves to be that way. They proved themselves to be liars. They proved themselves to be evil beasts. They proved themselves to be slow bellies. So Paul's like, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Correction, rebuking, these are good things. They don't feel good sometimes, but they're good things to get us back on the right path. I'm all for correction. I'm all for being rebuked as long as it lines up with this book. And there's times where I have been wrong and I had to take the correction. I want to line up with God's Word. I want to be preaching truth. I want God to be pleased with me. I want to be a good servant to my brothers and sisters in Christ, pointing you in the right direction. I pray for this all the time. I'm not above correction. Anybody that has an attitude and has a problem with correction and being rebuked, watch out. Now, there's times I've been corrected where I lined up with the book and they didn't. There's times I've been rebuked where I line up with the book, they don't. But every time I'm correct or rebuke, I go through the study again. Even if I think I know it, I know this. I know I'm right. And they're wrong. I'm right. I gotta keep reminding myself, it's not about me. Maybe God brought this person so I'd go back through the study again and refresh my memory on what the truth is. I verify, okay, did I make a mistake? Nope. Did I make a mistake? Oh, remember the book of John. Oh, John, it never once says John was isolated or um, exiled to the island of Patmos. There's times I get corrected and I go, well, I, my first, that's the first response you're supposed to have. You look and go, and you verify, if, is what I said true? Does it line up with your word, Lord? Did I make a mistake? Someone who's so proud of themselves, he won't even verify if he was right or wrong. He's just like, I'm always right has that attitude, that arrogance. But brothers of Christ, we're supposed to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Especially those in ministry. Verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables. Remember we heard the word fable mentioned earlier. Giving themselves over to fables. Okay? Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. These battle buildings are they're predominantly commandments of men. A lot of how they do things and what they do doesn't line up with the scriptures. doesn't line up with the Pauline epistles. It doesn't line up with what Paul says about a house church and how the uh, church is supposed to operate, how donations are supposed to operate. They like to go to the Old Testament and say, 10% tithe, 10, and everybody has to pay. That's not true for today. They can't stand to go. We've already done a huge study on this. Commandments of men. Today, donations, the, people, the only people that donate are those that are in abundance. And what is the donation for? Those that are lacking in the body of Christ. That's the only reason for donations today. Those that are in abundance, that God is overly blessed, you're supposed to help those that God, that God decided to, you know, that aren't blessed. They're lacking. Food, raiment, right? Bibles, gospel tracts. If a man is actually in full-time ministry and he's not living off the brethren, multiple properties, multiple vehicles, multiple toys then by all means, help a brother in Christ that's in ministry. But that's the whole point. Those that are in abundance are to donate to those that are lacking. So in, in the Pauline epistles, not everyone's supposed to give. There is no 10% tithe across the board. That's garbage. It's in the, but it's the, it becomes the commandments of men. They say, well, it was in the Old Testament. Notice it says, not giving heed to Jewish fables. 
The Jews come in and say, you have to be circumcised. That's Old Testament. That's not for today. That was true for the Old Testament, but it's not true for today. You've got to keep the holy days, Sabbath days, and new moon. Well, that was true for the Old Testament, but that's not true today. You've got to observe the touch not, taste not, eat not. Colossians chapter 2, touch not, taste not, eat not. Well, that was true for the Levitical laws in the Old Testament, but that's not true for today. The commandments of men. When someone says you have to give 10% tithe, I go to the Pauline epistles and say, chapter and verse, Paul says you're not to give grudgingly, nor of necessity. The moment someone says you should give, they're making it necessity. The moment they say you have to give, they're making it necessity. What they're supposed to do is simply say, hey, I'm hurting this camera that we're using right now. The old camera was bad. I was hurting. I could barely, I could, I think I came up with a third of the price. The brethren helped the rest. I came to the brethren and said, listen, if God puts it on your heart, I, I'd like to get a new camera. And I had brethren jump up to help me, praise God. I didn't tell them that if you love me, you'll give me money. Or you sh or go into this huge thing about you should be given money and everything. No, I just simply asked. I made my request to the brethren. This is what I need help with. And the brethren came and helped. Praise God. That's how it's supposed to be. You're just supposed to give, not of grudgingly, not of necessity, but of a cheerful heart. Those that are in abundance should have a cheerful heart. And you should be helping out them. Okay? You should be helping those that are lacking. But when someone stands up and says, we need help, they, don't, they shouldn't be coming up telling me, you should be giving and blah, blah, blah. No, they just come up and say, hey, I need help. I'm, I'm appealing to the body of Christ. We need help with this. And if God lays it on your heart, we're here. That's how it's supposed to be for donations. But I didn't mean to get off on that. But commandments of men comes in in these battle buildings. Almost everything they do when it comes to works, maybe not everything, but a lot of it, is commandments of men that turn from the truth. They're not doing things God's way. I hit him up and said, where's Paul doing an altar call? I know, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it smacks you across the face. When you come a, a true King James Bible believer and you start reading this book, you're like, where was that at? I was told about this. I was told about that. I was told, where is this? Where is building a building, calling the building a church, and inviting both saved and lost to it? Where is doing a YouTube channel and claiming your full-time ministry now? Where is declaring yourself an ordained elder? Where is declaring yourself a bishop and a deacon? Where is all this stuff? It's not there. They turn themselves from the truth. Verse 15, unto the pure all things are pure. Those who are truly saved and born again, we're working. When you're newly saved, you're really, got, like I said, you've got a lot to clean up. But at some point, you're going to get to the point where you look at your life and you say, Lord, I am so grateful that you got me here. Only you could have gotten me where I'm at. I remember my life before I got saved. I remember my life after salvation when we first got started. How messed up it was. And God got me here. Sanctification. Unto the pure all things are pure. Would we just read? The words of the Lord are pure words. Thy word is very pure. Every word of God is pure. Unto the pure... You're hiding your, God's word in your heart and living it. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But to them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their minds and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny Him. Their life doesn't line up with this book. In works, they deny Him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, reprobate. Remember what reprobate means, worthless. Even the good works that they do do that lines up with this book, it doesn't mean anything. Why? Because they're not earning rewards in heaven. They're still earning wages. The wages of sin is death. They're still earning death, and they're earning wages. It's leading to that death. That's why it means that their good works are reprobate. If you're saved and born again, your good works are never reprobate. You can still fail the Lord. You can fall flat on your face. But you're earning rewards in heaven. This is talking about a false convert, a false brethren, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Turn to 2 Titus chapter 3, verse 1. 
They deny, but in works they deny him. Being abominable. When I was a false convert, I thought most of the world was, like half the world was Christians and everyone had their profession of faith. But when I started learning this book, I got truly saved, born again, true plan of salvation. I started learning that first year. I learned more in my first year of being a real Christian, truly saved and born again, than I did, I think, I counted 15, 16 years in these Babel buildings. I learned that they're abominable. I was abominable before I got saved, truly saved and born again. I was disobedient. And under any good work that I did do, it was reprobate. Titus 2, or 2 Titus 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. I did this, and I did that. I had some brethren doing that. I did this, and, and I sacrificed my day to be here with you guys, and I did this, and I... They're puffing themselves up. Where's God getting the glory? When you have someone that's loving their own selves, they take all the glory for themselves. They don't give God the glory. They take it for themselves. Covetous. It's the world that matters, and the things of the world that matter. Loving the things of the world more than they love God. You start coveting the things down here. But I'm not supposed to be going through every single one. Boasters. Proud. Pride is killing a lot of the brethren and taking them out one by one. Pride does. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affection. The sodomites. We see that a lot today. They're trying to make sodomites like, you can be a sodomite Christian. No, you can't. You can be an ex-sodomite and be, and be saved and born again. But you can't be a present tense sodomite. And now you got sodomite preachers in these Babel buildings. Okay. The natural man, remember what the Bible said about the natural man? If our gospel be hid, it's hidden and lost. They, are, they that are of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. They of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. They talk and they promote all this stuff we're reading right here. And the world buys it hook, line, and sinker, these false ministries. And they buy it hook, line, and sinker without natural effects and truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. What more bigger despisers of those that are good than those that attack the changed life after salvation, living for Jesus Christ? that's guaranteed to come if you truly get saved and born again. That's how you prove yourself. They want One thing I left out, they want, there was a good analogy where they said, if you're put on trial right now, this is the foundation, this is the law that you're being held accountable to. If you're put on trial for being a Christian, and this is what you're being judged off of, is there enough evidence to find you guilty? No. Four. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasures. More than lovers of God. I always keep pointing this out. It doesn't say they don't love God. They just love the world more. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrows of the world worketh death. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They love their sin. They can't give up their sin. They can't come to the God. I'm not talking about giving up their sin by as far as cleaning up their life. I'm talking about, remember the Bible? Uh, King David said, If I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. They're holding those sins and that worldliness, the sorrows of the world, they're holding it in their heart and they don't want to let it go. It needs to be thrown at the foot of the cross. And we're not talking about cleaning up your life, sanctification. We're talking about what's important here. We're talking about the heart. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of death. I'm oh, sorry, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Those brethren, I believe some of them were saved, I believe some of them were false. False brethren came in and messed up the truly saved brethren. Oh, hell, there's nothing wrong with it. There's still some good Hollywood movies and TV shows and video games aren't bad. And we can give God thanks for giving us the money to buy the video games and the movies and, and everything. What is that? You're dealing with guys that have a lover of pleasures more than lovers of God. Because if they love God, they'd have given up that filth and that garbage, those addictions, that sin and wickedness. 
Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We've always taught this because the Bible always teaches that. What's the power of the gospel? The new creature in Christ Jesus. The changed life. I look at my life today, there's lost people that knew me when I was lost. And they come across me today and go, that ain't the same person. What happened to you? The power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is God can save someone and turn his life around and now he belongs to God and he's, he's blameless with the life that he's living. We talked about that. You need to work hard to be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's sanctified. He fears God. He's always talking about God's word. He's always praying. He's always in that book. That, that pesky book. He's a, he acts like an ambassador for Jesus Christ. He's always trying to witness to me. Sanctification. He won't hang out with us anymore. He said that the things we do, He doesn't do anymore. He won't do anymore. And He tells us why. Because it offends God. And His job is to please God, not offend Him. And sin is sin, and He can have nothing to do with sin. Sanctification. Denying the power thereof. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The power of the gospel is what? The changed life. And that's exactly what the number one false gospel today that's most famous is the gospel where there is no power in that gospel. There is no changed life. Oh, you don't have to change your life. You can continue living however you want to live and do whatever you want. You're the final authority. What does the Bible say here? From such, turn away. This whole list here. From such, turn away. Well, I believe he's saved. It doesn't matter. If he won't take correction and won't get his heart right with the Lord, from such, turn away. For this is of this, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins. Also no head covering. Led away with diverse lusts, especially when they try to be their own head covering. Verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's people out there, very religious people, and they're ever learning. They're reading books after books after books after books when all they needed was one book. But they never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds. Reprobate concerning the faith. This is not talking about brethren falling away. This is talking about people who are flat out lost. They're reprobate concerning the faith. They're fake. They're worthless. But they shall proceed no further. Why? Because we're proving them. You've proven yourself to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. You've proven yourself to be a fake and a fraud. Get out. You're not welcome here. And you're not welcome in our fellowship. You're not welcome here. I try to talk to people all the time online when I'm talking, when someone comes and says, I disagree with this or I disagree with that. The first thing I've learned, and this is a hard thing to learn, brothers and sisters, I always wanted to get into debates with them and start going through the scriptures. And we're going back. I've learned to ask these questions before you get into any discussion with anybody online. I ask them, are you a King James Bible believer? Did you follow the true plan of salvation? And I spell out the true plan of salvation. Are you dispensational? Those are the three biggest things, okay? They need to be a King James Bible believer. I probably should put salvation first, but the true plan of salvation is found in the King James Bible. King James Bible believer, true plan of salvation, and dispensational teaching. And from there, then we can keep going. But I've come across people, oh no, I don't, I don't care for the King James. I study the Greek, the original Greek. They've never seen the originals. Oh, I, I like the NIV and everything. We can't, you can't get into arguments with people that when you're not on the same page, when you don't have the same foundation. That's when you're starting to cast pearls before swine, and that which is holy among the dogs, and it'll turn around and rend you. You're going to end up wasting your time when it can be better spent elsewhere. I've learned to ask those three questions before we get into anything. Any subject of the Bible, instruction, righteousness, doctrine, uh, different dispensations, you ask those three, and almost any time that it seems like they're attacking you, brothers of Christ, you'll find out they're messed up on one of those three things. They might say the King James Bible is God's perfect written word. They might say they got saved off the true plan of salvation. But when you're dealing with the post-trib and mid-trib, they're not dispensational. 
and you won't get anywhere with them until they become and dispensational. They line up with this book. Paul says the dispensation of the grace that's given to me to you word. If they're non-dispensational and they refuse to be dispensational, you're not going to pre you're not going to get them over to the truth of the day of Christ, the blessed hope, the day of redemption, being caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. You're never going to run them over until they learn what dispensational teaching is. Because I got into it with a guy, and he kept running back to uh, Matthew 24, I think it was Mark 13 and Luke 15. I get them mixed up, but the sermon's on the mount. He kept running back to the Old Testament. He'd run to like Hebrews or James. He'd run to things that the books that aren't written for us today. Okay. Now Hebrews, I don't want to get into it, but Hebrews, as I read it, it starts out where I believe it's Paul writing it. He writes to Jew, uh, Hebrews today, get saved today. If not, then as you get into Hebrews, he's talking about what they're going to have to go through through the time of Jacob's trouble. You got to be very careful, rightly dividing. 2 Timothy 2.15 is the number one verse for dispensational teaching. You have to rightly divide what dispensation is for us. What's written to us and what's written for us. Those are two different things. Okay. Um, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall not proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Now there is that saying, the Bible says that, uh, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. There's times where you can get to talking to them, and their true, nature, their true self comes out, and they're messed up. You can when it comes to the Bible. But when it comes to proving yourselves, you can have someone who's saved that's messed up a little bit doctrinally, because he got, he got sent down the wrong path. So you plant seeds, brother, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves to get them back on the right path. But we are to judge. We're to prove our salvation, and we're supposed to make other people prove their salvation. Are they saved? Are they one of us? Are they men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith? The major doctrine, what I call them, what they call them major doctrines, but the, what I've learned is doctrines are teachings that are just for today or revealed today. Then other teachings, instruction righteousness, you can go through the whole Bible for instruction righteousness, but the main doctrines for today, you find them in the Pauline epistles. I know I get called a Paulinian, oh, he's a Paulinian. The gospel for today is found in the Pauline epistles. We call it eternal security, but being sealed into the day of redemption, knowing that you're saved and sealed, and only one person can break that seal, and that's Jesus Christ when he calls you home. But we call it eternal security. We learn that from the Pauline epistles. Dispensational teaching, we learn that from the Pauline epistles. The Godhead teaching, it, that was always the truth, but we learn about the Godhead from the Pauline epistles. The day of Christ, that blessed hope, that we get, we're looking for that blessed hope, we're going up. You learn that from the Pauline epistles. And you're warned that we're not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. From the Pauline epistles. Those are what I'd call the major doctrines. Some brethren get them mixed up. Uh, Peter Ruckman once said, he, he quoted, from, I think, from James, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and braideth not, and it shall be given to him. See, that's doctrine. No, it isn't. That's instruction and in righteousness. That's true across the board, no matter what dispensation you're in. That's what instruction and in righteousness is. Doctrine means that that would be only for today. Is that only for today? No, it's not doctrine. Now, you can get on to me and say, hey, you probably got that wrong. I'm here. Comment section, I've always leave myself open to video Skype brethren and everything. I'm here. We'll talk about it. But I'm learning that doctrine is teachings that are just for a given dispensation. Is there doctrine throughout the whole Bible? In every dispensation there's doctrine. But it's not for us. The doctrines that are for us, the Pauline epistles. And I just linked, I just listed all of them. Then they'll start grabbing stuff that all things work together. That's a doctrine. No, that's a teaching. All things work together for good to them that love God. You're taking his word, heighten your heart, living it. To, all, to those that are called according to his purpose, you're saved and born again. Those are the two requirements for all things to work together for good. But bottom line, that works in all dispensations. As long as you're hiding God's word in your heart, we read about your words are pure words, as silver tried in fire seven times. Thy words are pure words, therefore thy servant loveth it. In any dispensation, 
All things work together for good. If you're taking God's words, God's commands, and hiding them in your heart, and you belong to Him. There's instruction in righteousness. Sorry to go off on that a little bit, but men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Back to the study. John warns of people that are not of us. You know, John also warns it. Turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby ye know that this is the last time, that they went out from us, but they were not of us. Well, come on, John, you're judging. We're not supposed to judge. You don't make people prove themselves, and you're not supposed to prove yourself. John is judging. They went out from us. They went out from us, but they were not all of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be all manifest that they're not all of us. It's a false convert. It's someone whose faith is reprobate. Not faith. They don't have the faith. They're reprobate. They're fake. They're worthless. They're false brethren. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They're not of us. Their works, when they went out from us, it's their works. We started holding them accountable to this book, and what they do? I don't want any of that. I'm out of here. And they take off. You catch them and say, hey, you're not, I thought you said you believed, pardon me, I thought you said you believed the gospel that's found in this book. I thought you were, you believed in repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. Oh, no, no, I'm easy, they, I'm easy believism. They call it easy believism, but repentantless gospel. In fact, I don't even think we should have prayer in there. That's a work. Prayer is a work. Repentance is a work. They went out from us, but they were not all of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. You can have brethren that fall away when it comes to different parts of the Bible, like lust of the flesh, and get messed up on some doctrine, some, but when it comes to this book being perfect, God's perfect written word, when it comes to the true plan of salvation, no, no. There is no getting messed up. They went out from us, but they were not all of us, for if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. We're supposed to be putting them out. And letting them be manifest that they're not of us. I'm not with them, and they're not with me. You're against the gospel of the King James Bible. I'm not with you, and you're not with me. You're not with us. Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. You're a fake. You're a fraud. But here you have John warning us that there are false brethren among us. Why does the world hate proving, judging, proving, Turn to Acts chapter 24, verse 12. Acts 24, verse 12. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raised up the people, neither in the synagogue, nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Jump over to Acts chapter 25, verse 7. Acts 25, verse 7. Chapter over. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood about round about, and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. The lost world and these false converts love to make accusations against you. Why? That they can't prove. And they take the word, we don't need to prove it. We don't have to prove it. They don't like proving. They don't like it. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. This is Paul. They're trying to put a lot of accusations against him. All he's doing is preaching the truth. The love of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and what he did for him on the cross. Repent and believe. I know, repent. Romans road to hell. Romans road to hell. It's actually Corinthians that really push home repentance. And Paul calls uh, the Corinthians, he, calls, uh, he thinks that they're false converts. That's what we got a lot of those verses. Prove your own selves. Okay. I mean, if, uh, was it 2 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? Who's that preached to? It's, it's, it's the number one go-to verse for what the gospel is, but who is he preaching it to? Professing saved sinners. It's starting to warm up now. Professing saved sinners. Right. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. 13. For such are false apostles. 
deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. We're to judge their works. But what do they do? They try to take judgment away. Or, not judgment. Yeah, judgment. they proving. They have to take, they take proving away. They can make accusations against you without proving it. But when we prove their fault to the scriptures, they're saying we can't prove. They're trying to get away with it. Why? So Satan can get his ministers in. So he can get his, pe his people, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, false converts. I call them snakes sometimes because snakes will slither in where they don't belong and try to hide among you. They don't want you judging because they don't want you to see the, the servants of Satan that are there to cause problems, to cause division. Turn to John 8, 44. Remember it says, They transform in the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 8, verse 44. Their ends are according to their works. Their works don't line up with this book. Also, if you want to read that in a way that, in the, when they're reprobate, they're false brethren, then they're going to be judged according to their works at the great white throne judgment. The great white throne where they're going to be judged according to the Levitical laws, according to their works. We are judged according to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. They're going to be judged according to the Levitical laws. They're, they're still under the law of sin and death. The wages of sin is death. John 8, 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil. You never figure that out unless you make someone prove themselves and you judge their works. You judge their words and you judge their deeds, their works. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. How can you tell if someone's lying if you don't check up to see if what they're saying is true? That's the only way you can find out if someone's lying. Unless you already know the truth, or you research the truth. Remember the Bereans, we always say this, Berea time, Berea time. Why? Because when someone says, thus saith the Lord, it better be in here. They better be in there. But you have your father there. Why, doesn't the, why does the world hate proving? Because they can't sneak into us and act like they're one of us unless they do away with the judging. They do away with the proving yourselves. Once they've done away with that, which they have in the battle building systems, these ba I call them battle buildings that they call church buildings, building a building and inviting both saved and lost to it, you've done away with the judging and proving yourselves. Satan's having a field day in these battle buildings. Just messing people up left and right. They're so worldly. They're against they, their lives that they're living. What they're standing for sometimes is against what this book teaches. They're starting to get back into the world. Here it is. Since they cannot prove Bible-believing, God-fearing brethren wrong, nor do they want to be proven, like I said, they want to be able to sneak in, between, sneak in and, and be like a chameleon in one of us. And pretend like, I'm one of you. I'm one of you. Whatever you do, don't judge me. Whatever you do, don't make me prove myself. Because then I can't hide among you and mess you guys up. Which is what they do. Okay? So since they can't prove Bible-believing, God-fearing brethren wrong, nor do they want to be proven, so what do they do? What's the next step? They're trying to get rid of being proving yourself. Proving yourself. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. What do they do? They start messing with this book. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Proverbs 36. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Revelation chapter 22, verse 19. Now, I believe Revelation 22, 19, when it talks about the, the instruction of righteousness, this is true. When it's talking about the punishment, the plagues, I believe it's for those in the time of Jacob's trouble. 
because today there's people that are adding to and subtracting from all the Bible and they don't have those plagues. That doesn't mean the Bible's wrong, it's just people need to realize Doctrinally, this is not for us today for the, when it comes to the consequences. Instruction righteous, didn't I just read in Deuteronomy and Proverbs? Now we're reading in Revelation. This is true across the board. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, Revelation, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. What's the instruction of righteous? Once again, you have he's warning you, you don't mess with the Word of God. There's going to be consequences if you mess with the Word of God. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, you mess with the book of Revelation, there's serious dire consequences. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Some, people, some of these things I don't get. And sometimes the brethren can get puffed up with themselves and think, i got to know all the, I have to have all the answers. So when they come across something they don't understand, what do they do? Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do all the other scriptures to their own destruction. You start trying to force the Bible into a way where you can understand it instead of saying, Lord, I don't get it. I've had to do that several times in my life, brothers and Christ, sisters in Christ. I don't get it. And you wait and you be patient and you keep reading this book through and through and God will start saying, hear this, and then maybe a month down the road, six months down the road, God will answer your prayer and say, this is what this means. And you can compare it with this scripture over here and you can compare it with this scripture over here. you got to be patient. But you got people that aren't patient and they jump the gun and they try to make the Bible say what they, what they want it to say so they can understand it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, the Pauline epistles. Paul even warns about people messing with the Word of God. See, this is instruction righteous across the board. You don't mess with the Word of God. When they can't prove you wrong by standing for this, they go like this. And they start talking world wisdom, man's wisdom, man's words, philosophy, the world's way. Well, we always have done it. A little bit don't hurt. And that whole series of things, you know, we know when to quit. That's just your interpretation. It all depends on how you look at it. They start going off of man's words. And they'll change this book and use their words to try to push things. Verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as a sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. In other words, there's people corrupting the word of God. They're messing up. Paul says, here's the word of God he's given me to give to you, and someone comes along and messes it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. He does it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden, hidden things of dishonesty. I know, brethren, that God called them to do a house church and street witnessing, but they keep pushing other things. The Bible doctrine of off-gridology, which is the lowercase g God of off-gridology. How the door-to-door -door gospel tracting is unbiblical. And I fell into that. How this, that God called you to do a house church and street witnessing, and what are you doing? You're, doing? you're being dishonest and trying to make this book line up with what you wanted instead of you lining up with what God wanted you to do. Not walking in craftiness. Not handling the word of God deceitfully. I said this before, brothers and Christ, there are brethren that I love and care about that I see them falling away. And they're starting to act like these wolves in sheep clothings, these false converts out there, these hirelings out there in the battle building system on YouTube, where this book is the clay and they're acting like the potter. And this book, they can mold it to however they want to mold it to. We are the clay, he's the potter. And we get molded to how God wants us to. 
If a brethren are falling away, you might have to break fellowship with them. There's lost a lot of fault wolves in sheep's clothing. But when you have someone that you first come across and, and they're adding to God's word, they're subtracting from God's word, they're correcting this book, they're going outside the book to prove points that the book refuses to teach, especially when they go to the Apocrypha books. They go outside the Bible to prove what the Bible's against. The Bible's against it, so we're going to go outside the Bible to prove what we want. Teachers having teachers having itching ears. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Commending ourselves. Another way of saying, prove yourselves. I proved it. You did right. That's where commending yourself comes in. You're doing what's right according to the book. And everyone, in the sight of everyone's conscience. Conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid... It's hid to them that are lost. People who don't want the truth. The Bible says, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. I tried preaching the truth to somebody who kept cutting me off, cutting me off, cutting me off, cutting me off. And I got to the point where I said, I can't help you. And I, I gave him a gospel tract. I saw the magnet on the back of my truck and I pointed at it. It talks about heaven and hell. If you died today, would you be in heaven or hell? It shows uh, someone's version of heaven and someone's version of hell. And I said, without Jesus Christ, this is where you're going. If you refuse to repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you, you will go to hell and then get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. And until you come to the end of yourself, I can't help you. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. He kept cutting me off because he didn't want to hear the truth. These people that have a repentantless gospel, no repentance gospel, which means no changed life gospel. Some of them are deceived, which is why I keep trying to reach out to them and preach the truth to them. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Uh, and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if peradventure they should recover themselves out of the snare of the devil that are taken captive by him at his will. I want to see him get saved. I want to see him get born again. But there are some that they don't care. They don't, they don't, they're not changing. They're not budging. They love their sin. They love their worldliness. They're their own God, whose God, who's bel God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, whose end is destruction, who mind earthly things. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Remember? In the Gospels, He's talking about how Jesus is the light of the world. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, that men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil, neither cometh they to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. Who's the image of God should shine unto them. We're supposed to be having the breastplate, uh, our, the whole armor, armor of God. And it's called the armor of light. Where Jesus, they're supposed to see Jesus in us and it reflects on them. Their sinful state, their condition, they're on their way to hell and they deserve to go to hell. Verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. Your servants for Jesus' sake. Brothers and sisters, Christ, remember, we're serving the Lord when we preach the gospel. We're not supposed to be car salesmen. We're not supposed to bully people into salvation. We're not supposed to bribe people into salvation. We're not to guilt trip anybody into salvation. We're to preach the truth and God will do the breaking. Remember what, what Jesus, once again what Jesus said in the Gospels, Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken. God does the breaking. And of course, whoever this stone shall fall on, it will ground him to powder. Okay? But whoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. That stone is Jesus Christ. God will do the breaking. God will do the convicting. We're just to preach the truth. And we're not to water down the gospel to get people saved. Because you're not getting people saved. You're creating false converts. They'll change the word of God to make those that stand for the word of God look bad. Like me. Like you, brothers and sisters of Christ. And they do attack, and another thing they do is they attack your faults. Like I said, they'll go like this. They'll start adding to this, subtracting. One thing I left out is they will attack your faults. I have faults. I've made mistakes. 
They'll hold past mistakes against you. They'll start trying to tear down your character. I kicked a brother in Christ, lowercase g gods. His idolatry that he's holding in his life. Remember, if you love something in this world more than you love the Lord, it becomes an idol. I know brother in Christ used to be a great preacher, great man of God. He's got a lot of idols in his life. And I kicked his idols. And what did he do? He went on a political smear campaign to destroy my character. They'll, why is it, why, brethren, you have brethren that fall away and they start acting like the wolves and sheep's coasting because when I was newly saved, trying to stand for this book, they would always, anytime I made a mistake, they would pounce on it. They would always try to tear my character down, these wolves and sheep's clothing, these hirelings, these false converts. They'll do that. I do make mistakes. I've made some big ones in my walk with the Lord. Okay? When you're you can always tell somebody who can't handle the scriptures because they leave the scriptures and start attacking you personally. I'm like, let's stick to the scriptures. I, I, I The scriptures, I can quote scripture after scripture. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Okay, Those Hollywood movies, those TV shows, and those video games are bad. And when they couldn't handle the scriptures, they attacked me personally. I kicked another brother's lowercase g God of Christmas. Lowercase g God of off-grid living. What did he do? He couldn't handle the scriptures, so he started attacking me personally. Even went as far as to say I killed my own daughter when my daughter passed away. Brother, they're going to attack you. And it could come, remember it says, of your own selves. Of your own selves men shall arise, speaking perverse things. Of your own selves. There are great men of God that have fallen away. They haven't, you know, they're not standing. They're fallen. And if it can happen to them, brothers and Christ, it can happen to us. We're supposed to be judging ourselves first, and then we're supposed to be judging our brothers and sisters in Christ second, and then we judge the world to witness to them third. Now, real quick, I want to go into two more parts, and we're almost done. I'm sorry this was a long study. Command to not fellowship with lost people. There's a command. We're not These battle buildings can't seem to get that. They invite lost people in, and they fellowship, they invite servants of Satan. When I was lost, as a professing Christian, when I was lost, I was, I was a servant of Satan. Willingly or unwillingly, ignorantly. I never, I never would just stand up and just say, I'm a servant of Satan. But looking back, I was used of Satan. When someone's lost, they can be used of Satan to really mess people up. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, plural. We're going to keep going because there's more evidence on this, but they'll try to make this it's just about marriage. No, it isn't. This is across the board. It has to do with everything, not just marriage, everything. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Your body is the temple of God. And you're hanging out with idols when, you go, when it comes to fellowship. Not going to work. You have to work around lost people. You have to work next to lost people sometimes. You have to live next to lost people. The Bible says that it be possible live peacefully among all men. This is talking about fellowship. When you invite lost people into your fellowship, you're now inviting idols into your fellowship. You're inviting the lowercase g God of this world into your fellowship. For ye are the temple of the living God. Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost, and be without blemish. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Plural. Don't talk about marriage. Them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. It's talking about fellowship. 18. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Hence, love not the world. We talk about it all the time. Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a good example of someone who's lost, 
But there are brethren that are falling away, that are given into idols, and it's not people this time, it's things. It can be people, like a wife or a husband or children, or yourself. You look in the mirror, you can be an idol. When that person in that mirror comes first before the Lord and His Word, you can make yourself out to be an idol. But you start loving things of the world more than you love the Lord. And that the love of God doesn't shine through you as much, if at all, anymore. I've seen that with brethren that have fallen away. But more than anything, you see it in this all the false gospels and the false organized religion that's out there. Their love is just something they say. It's a burning in the bosom. But their works say they don't have the love of God. They have a love of the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You don't invite the world into your fellowship. In order to do that, you start loving the world. In order to do that, you start conforming to the world. And the Bible says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, the friend of the world is talking about the ways of the world. Okay, I always tell people, I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. I'm not your enemy when it comes to preaching the truth to the lost world, the person. But when it comes to the world as a whole, we're not to love the world or be a friend of the world. When you invite lost people in, you start compromising the gospel. You start compromising how you do things. And the next thing you know, you go in there and say, okay, we never confessed our faults one to another. We never got prayer requests from one another. We didn't hear the word of God being read. Some guy got up there for 15 minutes to uh, 15 to 30 minutes and they talked more worldly than they ever did preaching the Word of God. And we sang hymns together, but those hymns are pretty worldly and, and fleshly. And I've, I, I've, that's why I've told brother, you need to go through hymns sometimes and make sure they line up with the Word of God. Some of them are like, did they just say what they think they said in that hymn? That's not what the Bible says. They strayed so much from the world, from the Word of God and doing things God's way. We're to come together to confess our faults one to another, to pray for one another, to sing hymns together, to hear the Word of God being read. Paul says in Thessalonians at the end of the, that this epistle be read among the church daily. I think he said something like daily, but read among the church. We're supposed to hear the Word of God being read. We're supposed to hear the Word of God being preached. And there's only supposed to be saved sinners. When you're doing this, when you start inviting lost people in and fellowshipping with the lost world, all that gets compromised. Next thing you know, you're doing donuts and coffee and you've got secular style music going and it's more of a social club. You got that social club atmosphere talking about the world and worldly things and you got to start bringing in Hollywood movies. You start bringing in poker night and you start bringing in men's golf club. Golf club and men's movie night and women's you know this and you start bringing the world it becomes a social club because you got to please these lost people because this doesn't please them they're lost doing things god's way doesn't please them they're lost so what do you got to do you got to start compromising why is it so important to make people prove they are in christ a christian because in the time of Jacob's trouble, it will be so important, and people are getting programmed now that will be going into that time period to not try the spirits, to make people prove themselves. Today, if you're truly saved and born again, you invite a, a false convert in, you can get really messed up. You can get sidetracked. You can watch brethren get messed up. But you won't lose your salvation. Why? Because... Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You are saved. Period. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, Revelation 2.9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. You've got to try people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Because if someone comes in and starts messing you up, you can lose your salvation. There are sins unto death in the time of Jacob's trouble. There are sins that if you commit those sins, you're toast. You go to hell to burn for all eternity. Not today. 
Not for the time of the, the Gentiles, but the time of Jacob's trouble. The biggest one we always point out is you take the mark and you worship the beast, you're toast. We just read one in Revelation. You mess with this book, the prophecies of this book, Revelation. Notice it says prophecies of this book. Um, not all books in the Bible are prophecy. Paul, uh, to Timothy, First and Second Timothy, that's not prophecy. It's teaching Timothy how to be a man in ministry. And Titus. Okay. There are sins unto death in that time period. And one of the things is, blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogues of Satan. Uh, go back to verse 2. It says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. I believe one of the biggest deceptions in the time of Jacob's trouble is they're going to come to them and tell them that, that they are eternally secure. You're sealed into the day of redemption. That's for today. But when you go into the time of Jacob's trouble, it's not for that time period. You can take the mark. The Bible warns about damnable heresies. Damnable heresies. What that means is, is you get into a heresy, you're, if you do something that you're not supposed to do, a sin unto death, you're now damned. That's what a damnable heresy. They try to grab that and apply it today. There are no damnable heresies today. They're just heresies today. I was in some heresies, and someone corrected me and got me on the right path. You cannot lose your salvation today, period. There are no damnable heresies today. There's just heresies that there's lost people falling for it. They're already damned. I'm not damned, sorry. How do I say this? He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Lost people are already condemned. I was already condemned at one point. But anybody can get saved today, brothers and sisters of Christ. The damnable heresies in that time period are mainly any kind of heresy teaching that tells you you can take the mark and worship the beast and still be saved. And you're going to have false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing coming in trying to get you to do those sins unto death in the time of Jacob's trouble. It is so important, more important in that time period to really making sure that people are proving themselves. Are they one of us? Okay. Why is it important? Because in the time of Jacob's trouble, it can cost you your salvation. Today it won't. Today it will cost you your walk with the Lord. It will cost you your ministry. Your ministry will get hurt, hindered, or just outright destroyed. It will it, um, hurt, hurt your walk with uh, fellowship with the brethren. It can hurt your testimony. It can hurt your health. And so on. I don't know if you watched one of the studies. I like Peter Ruckman. His old studies was the, I can't remember how many, but so many things you can lose. But the one thing you can't lose today is salvation. But in that time of Jacob's trouble, you can. And people are being set up today with that antichrist spirit, that spirit that's even now in the world today, that the spirit of the world, that woman Jezebel. All right? So, brothers and Christ, this has been a long study, but I really want to get through it. The Bible does say we are to judge. We are to judge salvation. We're to prove ourselves and make sure and prove us. I'm proving that I'm saved. I'm a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. And I'm hiding God's Word in my heart, and I'm living it. Okay. Now, we're going to end this with this. The true test of whether we were right on those that are His versus false converts. I know some of you have already heard this before, but we're going to go through it real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must have put on immortality. So when this corruption shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's part of looking for that blessed hope. Therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Want, buy the truth and sell it not. Once you have the truth, you're to hold on to it and not let it go. But I see brethren falling and dropping like flies. They're movable, and you're not supposed to be. You're supposed to be unmovable. There's a difference between me saying something wrong or adding to this book when I shouldn't have, and I get corrected. But when it comes to the doctrines of the Bible, you're not supposed to be movable. This is God's perfect written word. You're not supposed to be movable on the true plan of salvation, on eternal security, on dispensational teaching, on looking present tense for that blessed hope, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be looking for it every day with the life you're living. Whether he comes back in your lifetime or not, you're supposed to be looking for it with the life you're living every day. And there's brethren that have turned their back on that. They live a life of posties, post-trib and mid-trib, but they have a profession. I'm pre-time at Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. But they live like they're post-trib. They're not looking for that blessed hope. They're not living every day like they're looking for that blessed hope. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Someday, Lord, brothers and Christ, we're going to get called home. You know, the whole body of Christ is going to get called home in life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangels, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Nobody's going to miss the catching away. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When will we realize who was truly saved and who's false converts? Because most of the world is false converts, and there's some people that are really good at parroting PWC, really good, I, we can call them chameleons. When will we really know? When we get caught up. So what do we do until then? We prove ourselves, brothers and sisters Christ. And we make each other, make anybody that claims to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, a Christian man, according to this book, we make them prove themselves. And we keep doing that till the catching away. And if I get to heaven and there was somebody I thought was lost and they're there with me, praise God! I'd rather be wrong and they're in heaven with me than to be right and not have said anything when I was down here. I'd rather err on the side of caution and warn them, hey, you're not lining up with this book. Maybe they find out they weren't saved, they were lied to, and they fell for a false gospel. And you can witness to them and give them the true plan of salvation. Maybe they'll get saved, and they will be with us up there. But that's when we're going to find out who was truly saved and who wasn't. And this has been a long study. Forgive me, Brother Sister Christ. Is it okay if we sing at least one or two hymns? <laughs> I'm gonna, for this, since we ended it with us going up, this is a good ver one of my favorite song songs that I like to sing, and I've seen it sung before. It's what a day that will be. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shores. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. 
What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day, glorious day that will be. Paul says that we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. Brothers and sisters Christ, there's going to come a day where there's not going to be any more division. No more wolves in sheep's clothing coming in to cause division. Or of our own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things, the falling away. There's going to come a day where we don't have to deal with it. We do have to deal with it now. And we need to deal with it properly. But there's coming a day, brother, says Christ. Are you looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living? I keep pushing this, brother, says Christ, because I'm not the final authority. This is the final authority. Are you staying in God's Word every day, reading it? Do you start your day with the Word of God? Do you end your day with the Word of God? Are you praying? Are you having some good fellowship with actual brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you living a life of Christ? Are you putting on the whole armor of God? The armor of light? Every day, putting down this flesh. Why? Because someday we get to go home. And when we get to go home, Paul talks, I think it's Paul that says that the things that we have to go, down, go through down here are not to be compared to what awaits us in heaven. There's uh, another hymn, we're not going to be singing it, it talks about a hundred years down below, we will not regret it, for he sold it long ago. Up there, we will not regret it, for he sold it long ago. What we have to go through down here is nothing compared to what we get to spend eternity with, our Lord and Savior. New bodies, white robes, no more division, no more wolves in sheep's clothing, they got left behind. No more false converts. They got left behind. Brothers says Christ, you can judge. You're supposed to be proving your salvation every day with the life that you're living. That God saved you and that you belong to Him. And you're supposed to be making sure that anybody that stands up and says, Hey, I'm one of you. That they're proving themselves that God saved them and that they belong to God. Their life lines up with this book. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next study.